Yeah, you have to turn it on. Great, so next speaker is uh, Lead uh, Noor and he's going to talk about uh, optimal enzyme profiles, principle and simple solutions. Okay, is it, is it working? Yeah? Hear me? Ah, maybe I'll, I'll put it higher, right? I'll just speak loud anyway. Um, where's the um, clicker? Okay, I, there's no one. No. Okay. Somebody took it. No, that one is for the. Ooh. Okay. Uh, uh, that sounds really great. Okay, never mind. I'll manage. <laughs> Okay, yeah, uh, so thanks for, uh, for staying so long and also thanks for the organizers for giving, for giving the questionable privilege of being last on the week. Uh, I hope I won't uh, exhaust you completely after like uh, all the pizzas I had, I'm also a little bit digesting. But, uh, the, but uh, I hope it's not, I, would tr I try to make it light. So please also like stop me in the middle, I mean, you already know that you can do that, but stop me in the middle if there are any questions. Um, so uh, yeah, so the idea was uh, of this talk is to talk about uh, optimality again, the little cursed word, uh, about the optimality of pathways. Uh, but I think uh, I'm not, just want to say in advance, we're not taking optimality too seriously in this talk, okay? We're just trying to see what happens when you assume uh, optimality. And I'll start with a quote of uh, Terry, like everybody else does. <laughs> um, uh, that, yeah, we should always think twice before assuming it. Uh, the problem is we, I made the, this presentation before uh, the quote was made, so I couldn't really change it in the last minute. But uh, I still want to try to justify why we do this. So uh, first of all, when, when you do it and it works, it's very, very satisfying. So that's why we keep doing it, even though it almost never works. But uh, yeah, but that's one reason. Another reason is that um, uh, usually optimality, I mean, are not, doesn't work across all experiments and all conditions and all species, whatever. Uh, but it might help us understand why, if something is suboptimal, what, what's the constraint of the system? Or maybe it doesn't, doesn't care. But. That's another option. But it's still interesting to know that, basically. Um, and uh, this is a bit closer to my heart specifically, is that it could have synthetic biology applications, okay? So it's not, we're not just thinking about understanding current biology, but also how can we engineer biology maybe in the future? So that's another reason to think about optimality. Um, and, uh, and so, yes, so, I wanted to start with genome scale models. Actually, today's tutorial is about FBA, so maybe it's a bit premature. But uh, um, in general, these kind of mo very large metabolic models, they assume everything is linear, or they need it for the, to do the calculations in a relatively fast, uh, which means that you have to assume something about the reaction rates and what, what's, bi what's binding them. And the most typical assumption is that nothing is binding them, which is not very realistic. Uh, sometimes they're just bounded by some upper bound. So this is usually used in FBA for flux balance analysis for like uptake rates. They're just bounded and that creates a little bit more reasonable uh, result. Uh, but uh, the more advanced models just give like an upper bound that's depending on uh, enzyme levels. So if you measure enzyme levels, you know more or less what's the upper bound. Uh, what, but this assumes the ma maximal efficiency can be achieved. Uh, and um, the last generation, I guess, of these models, they, they try to make some effective upper bound. So it's not really the k cat of the enzyme, but something more like a k apparent, we call it. Uh, but it still doesn't change really with, between conditions. And that's a little bit of a problem, because in, as you know probably, some of you, that uh, the, flux, the flux of a, a reaction is determined by the enzyme level, but also some kind of nonlinear function that depends on, on 
parameters and some kind of metabolite concentration. So a brief history of what are the, these functions look like. So uh, I just, I, I, I like this because it kind of makes an order of like what, a lot of people just use the word because Venten for everything. And I, actually I think you almost should never use their names, maybe. Uh, so uh, Henri is the first one who actually came up with a kind of phenomenological uh, React, uh, which already looks like the, this rate law that we know. Um, Mikhail Svendin just like uh, a, a bit simplified it, but also justified it based on some kind of uh, time separation model, basically, that the equilibrium of the binding is very fast. Uh, but actually, the people who I usually would like to cite are Briggs and Halden, and Halden later uh, basically came up with this reversible rate law, which we call reversible Mikhail Svendin, but actually they never did this uh, work. Okay. So we are going to use Haldane's rate law. I just write it a little bit differently here. Uh, so uh, I, I hope it's uh, clear enough. Uh, the parameters of the rate law are the enzyme, which we, we use epsilon, uh, a little bit non-standard notation, sorry about that. Uh, K cats are the forward, K cat is the forward and backward rate. Um, uh, the, the maximal rates, so forward and back weight. And then you have S, which is the substrate level, and KS, which is the Michaels constant of the substrate, and the same for P. Okay? So this is basically a, law that, uh, a rate law that depends both on substrate and product, and can go both ways also, depending on the equilibrium state. And Haldane also found that there is a connection between all these parameters and the equilibrium constant of the reaction, so enzymes cannot really change that, so th that's another constraint on the system. The four kinetic parameters are connected in a way that enzyme cannot change. Um, and then, what, like, uh, about 10 years ago, we tried to reformulate this law. Uh, it, this, th so the formula at the bottom is exactly the same as the one at the top, it's just using different parameters. It's the same exactly. Uh, we just did it to basically separate it to three terms, uh, which we call efficiency terms. So the maximal efficiency is the Vmax, like always. The middle term is like something that tells us something about thermodynamics, basically the reversibility of the reaction, and, and, uh, and it only depends on the driving force, or the delta G. Okay? We'll go into more, if you come to my tutorial on Monday, I'll go into more details about this. But it's, yeah, it's also written in, the, in this reference. Oh, sorry, it's not here, the reference. Ah, uh, oh, no, yeah, it is. Okay. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, the last term is just the saturation term, which you already should know, right, from Mikhail Smenton. Maybe there's a slight difference here that you also have the product in the denominator. But that, that could be ignored if the binding is very, very inefficient. Okay, so uh, that was the introduction. Now, now uh, the goal of, the, I was talking about optimality, so the optimality problem we're trying to solve, and Bob yesterday already mentioned it, is how to minimize the allocation of enzymes in a pathway. And a pathway can also be a whole cell. We'll talk about it in the end. Um, so it's very easy to do it when everything is linear, but when things are very nonlinear, it starts to be a complicated problem, right? So now we have all the parameters of the system are the enzymes, the metabolites, and the whatever, the steady state if it exists. Um, so this rate law case basically, to solve this, we said let's assume we have a pathway where all the, like it's a simple example where we know all the fluxes. Let's say even say they're all the same, and we just, basically say the demand for, the, for every, enzyme in the every enzyme in this pathway is the inverse of this, uh, all the efficiency terms, right? So the, K, the inverse of the K-cat, the inverse of the efficiency of the thermodynamic term, and the inverse of the saturation term. And, and this is how much enzyme we need per flux for every enzyme. So summing all these up give, give us the total demand or the total cost in some way. Uh, and I think also Bob mentioned this, we proved that this is convex. So it's solvable numerically at least. And there's only one optimal solution. I'm not sure cells care about this, but, but uh, us as scientists is very useful because we can find it at least pretty easily. 
and then check if it actually works or not. And we did it and we found some correlations. It's not perfect. There are a lot of things that are not optimal, of course, according to what we know now. Okay. Um, so uh, just to show a little bit example of how this works. Um, so if, if, if we assume it, actually throughout, throughout the whole talk, I'm only talking about linear pathways with no branching and only, only like a series of steps. This is a very simple assumption, I know, but this, this is what we need for like really doing some kind of deep analytics. Um, uh, so let us assume like this kind of series of three reactions from X to Y. Uh, and and uh, there are three enzymes here, okay? So three demands, basically. Uh, and what I'm plotting in these three plots are the, the, de the sum of the demands, so all the three demands, uh, as a function of, sorry, this is only the first demand, the second and the third, oops. The second and the third. Uh, and this is, the last one is the sum of all three. So at, in the, at the x and y axis are just the metabolite levels, okay? So we have two free variables, A and B, metabolite levels and steady state, and three dependent variables, which are the enzyme levels, okay? Uh, and then if you plot them, you see that each one of them is a kind of a convex function, and the sum is also a convex function. The gray area, uh, sorry, the gray areas are the infeasible regions. So you cannot even run the reaction in the right direction when you have, let's say, too much of B or too much of A, depending on the reaction. Okay, so that, that's why we get like this kind of triangle where things are feasible, and within this triangle, the function is convex. I think you saw something similar in Bob's talk also. Um, okay, any questions so far? Okay. It's not extremely necessary for the second part, but it's, uh, it's an introduction. Um, okay, so, so we did this already a few years ago, but like lately we said, we thought to ourselves, can we actually do this solution analytically? Can we, instead of just saying it's convex, saying what actually is the optimum point, okay? Uh, as a function of all the parameters. And in generally, the, okay, I'll tell you in a second why. It's generally not, but there are cases where it is. And why do we want it to be analytical? Um, first, uh, it's nice to have an analytical solution because numerical solutions sometimes tend to give you not precise or have numerical problems basically where you're not really sure that it's the optimum. Uh, if you have a formula, it, you can sign up, see the patterns, you know, just from the math, you sometimes see some kind of connections that you wouldn't see or you could see with a numerical solution but you have to look for them, right? You have to plot them in order to see them and from the math you can maybe just find it just by looking at the equation. Um, w what's more interesting for me is that the, we might find some design principles, so why things are geared in some way because there's a constraint, basically, based on the linear and the algebra. Um, and the last part is like maybe there's a mechanism behind all this, which is probably the main point here. Um, so, so the problem is, as I said, is that there is no analytical known analytical solution for the general problem. So what I showed you before, that's convex. With a Haldane rate law and everything, uh, it's not solvable as far as we know. Uh, but we do, we do I mean, I'll show you in a minute that we can do it for simple cases where everything is linear and there are no branching points. And one other constraint I didn't say so far is that we cannot use the full rate law. We have to simplify it somehow. Um, and you'll see in that in a minute. So, uh, so the model we're looking at, as I said, is a linear pathway. With the number of reactions here is three, but it could be any number. Uh, we put uh, a constraint on the total amount of enzymes. So we're trying to allocate the enzyme in the most efficient way to give, a, to give, give us a certain flux. Um, and uh, in one of the cases, we also have to have another constraint on the total amount of, subs of uh, metabolites in the pathway. But that's, that's a side note. I'll get to it later. Of course, we can also do the optimization if we say that enzymes are not, like the cost of the enzyme is not proportional just to the, sorry, it's proportional to their weight, to their uh, concentration, but not necessarily in the same weights. So we can do it with weighted averages. Um, 
that's, I, I won't talk about this today. Okay, so, um, yeah, so, so, so the problem, as I said, is you cannot, even the linear pathway, you cannot solve this rate law. It's just too complicated, as far as I know. So we, we did three different approximations and solved it for each one of them. Uh, the first one, I'll start from the right, actually, uh, has already been done uh, many decades ago, and basically it's assuming that the, uh, that the saturation basically is very low, like there's no saturation, or what we call the linear regime of the rate law. Uh, it doesn't look like that in, the, in this equation, but I'll explain in a minute how it works. Uh, the second approximation is close to equilibrium approximation, basically, or something that you can also say happens when you, when you are completely saturated, so only delta G can actually change the rate because the substrate saturation is complete. And the third example, uh, or the more, more interesting one today, is the mikhail Sventen approximation, which is going back in time to, to the one where there's no thermodynamics term. Basically, the reaction is completely irreversible. Uh, so we solved all three of them. Uh, okay, good, we're good in time. So let's we'll start with a mass action rate law. So first of all, why is it called mass action? That's because uh, uh, chemical reaction networks typically, like they only, the only thing that matters for the rate is the binding of, or unbinding of the substrate, right? And that, that basically means that everything is linear and like the, the enzyme never saturates. So as soon as, if you have more substrate, the rate will co continue to increase indefinitely. Uh, uh, so the rate, uh, if I going back to the or original formulation of Haldane, so this means that you're below saturation for both substrate and product, which means that this denominator is one. And then you get only, only the numerator, which is a, this kind of mass action uh, description where you have the forward rate, which is something times S, and then the backward rate, which is something times P. Okay, so this, it's, it's derived from Haldane, but we call it mass action because it looks like mass action. Um, and, and if we look at the chain and say the flux in this pathway is, uh, is con like it's a steady state, right? So all the fluxes are the same. Um, the, I don't need to actually do, reach my hand. <laughs> okay, so the, the enzyme level times uh, this right will be equal to J, and then we invert it and we solve it. Uh, and basically this has been done already in 64. Uh, um, by uh, Whaley, um, and, uh, and then you can see that you get the optimum flux when, uh, when you distribute basically enzyme in a certain way, and the, op the optimum flux will be a function of the, um, kind of the first substrate minus the last substrate times divided by K equilibrium. So this is kind of the equilibrium, this equilibrium of the whole system in a way divided by a very annoying term, but it depends only on kinetic parameters, okay? So there's nothing else there. Um, it's a bit hard to even understand, but it's like a product of a lot of the kinetic parameters. Um, okay. So, uh, yeah, so, so I, this is very, very nice uh, result. It's been used actually today even, it was mentioned, uh, in Matthias's talk, so uh, uh, the Costa paper that used, tried to use it to justify why you, you don't want to have long pathways and you want to split them, they actually use this result in, in some ways. So it's been known for a while. Um, okay. So the, now to the second one. <laughs> Sorry, so, so I, again, I, I, I'm not sure if it's clear. I, I'm not showing you the derivation, okay? It's, it's a bit long to show here, so, but you can read the paper if you want. Okay. Um, the, the second option is to say, okay, we, we're still like a kind of constrained by the, so we're still reversible, we still have forward and backward flux, but we don't care about the, saturate, the kinetic term, right? So we're saying it's one. Uh, and the thermodynamic is what, the only thing that matters. Okay, so all the reactions are, Let's say we're, when you're very close to equilibrium, this is a pretty realistic uh, state, I would say. Um, and this, th 
this, this is uh, our solution, but it's a bit, again, a bit too long to show here. But uh, we couldn't actually solve it completely. So we have a closed form formula, but it's not, it's not solvable, it's not invertible, basically, the function. But we found a very good approximation that works for any parameters we tried, and it's almost with no error. So I'm showing only the approximation. Um, and what's nice about it is if, if you compare it to, to the individual rate laws, it looks kind of similar, right? So the total enzyme times some expression that looks a little bit like the rate law itself, right? One minus e to the date, delta g. Uh, but this is the total amount of Gibbs free energy in the system. So from the beginning to the end, ignoring everything in the middle. Okay? So only, we only care about the total uh, disequilibrium. Okay, so this is, uh, again, second result. Uh, the last rate law we're considering is the Michaelis Mentum one, uh, which is unique in the sense that it's not reversible. So basically, all fluxes go in the, only in one direction. Okay, there's no reverse flux. Uh, and therefore, you don't see the product in the rate law. Okay, only the substrate. Um, and... Um, and to solve it, actually, first we had to realize that you cannot solve it with the assumptions we made so far, because, we, like, basically, to maximize the flux, you just increase the substrate indefinitely. You, all, you won't lose anything, right? So you just more and more saturated, you always increase the flux. So if you try to solve it like this, you get infinite solution uh, for the substrate, for the metabolite. So you have to add a const some constraint on the total amount of metabolite. So we added, like, a, the sum of the... All SIs is S dot. And, uh, and, and with this, actually, you can solve it using uh, just Lagrange multipliers, basically, inverting this function, deriving it, it works. And you find that the total flux, the optimal total flux, is again proportional to the total amount of enzyme times some kind of term, um, which is uh, depending on KCAT the Km over Kcat, and this s dot. If, if s dot is very, very large, you lose this term, and then you just get the sum of 1 over Kcat, which is, makes sense, basically. Because um, you can always be saturated in all the steps, right? So then you don't care about the Km. Good. So uh, these are the three solutions I'll discuss today. Um, and yeah, okay, so actually we, we wrote this uh, first as a kind of a chapter for the, ah, question? Yeah, question. Perfect, yeah, perfect timing. <laughs> yeah. Uh, this is nice, and uh, of course now I see that it probably depends on S dot, but uh, in this optimal solution with S dot, how the substrate considerations, internal substrate considerations, are relative to KIs. Uh, they can be larger, smaller, well, I guess they can be anything. Mm, that's, a, that's a very good question. Um, can we wait with this for the end? I think, I think it will be more, more interesting when we see a few examples. But you're asking, like, how do they change with, uh, with uh, what, with, uh, with KI? Yeah, and how okay. they are located relative. Should I think that the yeah. enzymes are relatively saturated or, or, or relatively linear? Yeah. So, okay, I'll, I'll get back to it. But basically, uh, uh, the, the system is not stable because it's irreversible. So, uh, so if you... If you if you want a, like a J which is bigger than one of the KIs, then you won't find the solution, right? So, um, sorry, uh, bigger than the total enzyme times one of the KIs. Like you won't be able to find sure. a, a fast enough enzyme. Uh, and also, it's not stable in the sense that um, any like it's you cannot like there's if you if you don't find the steady state, then it won't reach a new steady state, right? If you just allocate enzyme wrongly, you won't reach a steady state. It will just collapse. But, uh, but the SIs basically are very easy to solve. If you know the enzyme allocations, right, there's only one solution for the SIs. So they're kind of, as, and as, as you'll see, okay, as you see, everything is kind of flat. 
Anyway, you'll see it. OK. Um, OK, so, so, so we, were, we were already pretty happy just with the mathematical results without any implications in biology. But, uh, but then we thought, OK, maybe we can connect it a little bit also to some kind of uh, results we know, you know from uh, we, we discussed all week these results, so I don't want to repeat them. Uh, and uh, the basic, I think, one is, is something that we know well now is the Monod curve. Basically, um, why does, well, like, how do we describe this increase in a, in a rate law based on the substrate, initial substrate concentration? And, um, yeah, and we actually, the question we had is like, which one of these assumptions would work best for the, to fit this model? I mean, I think you can already guess, but you'll see in a moment. Um, so we considered, uh, again, a very basic uh, cell model with three steps. So one representing a transporter, one representing all the metabolism, and one representing ribosomes. Uh, and four metabolites, so the glucose concentration or the sugar, the intermediate uh, imported sugar, like a, let's say the phosphorylated version of it, uh, the precursors, which you can imagine are the, uh, the amino acids or tRNA charged amino acids, and, uh, and the biomass, which is the protein, right? mostly. Okay, uh, and, and of course there's dilution by like only of the last, uh, only of the last uh, step. Uh, the, the other uh, phenomenon we, want, we wanted to describe is this linear allocation of enzyme. Here I'm actually showing not the ribosomes because we already saw that many times, but, but the, like the allocation of the, the lac operon, right? So when you increase, increase growth rate, the lac operon actually uh, decreases. So basically when you're limited, you need to, carbon limited, you need to express more of the transporter to get more carbon in, compensate. Um, and, uh, and that's this, now I'm just laying down the assumptions that I said. So again, the model has three steps. Uh, yeah, st three steps and then growth. Uh, the parameter we're going to change, basically see what, how we respond to it, is the sugar concentration. The total enzyme is constant. Uh, the growth rate is maximized. And the rate laws, so we're going to use the same rate law for all three reactions either mass action, thermodynamic, or Michaelis Menten. Uh, something we didn't include and we would like to, but it's a bit hard to do at the moment, is the dilution of the metabolites. Okay, so the enzymes, of course, are diluted. We have to regenerate them. But the intermediates are, are not diluted in the model, which is not realistic, because at least amino acids, dilution could have a strong effect. Um, but we're not sure. Uh, okay, and the extra constraint only for the Michaelis Fenton case, I told you. So, uh, so the solutions are, are already written before, but I'll, I'll just, I rewrote them in the, in the notation of the model. So there are three reactions. Uh, there's K, yeah, so there's the KM of the transporter, the K cat of the transporter. Again, R is ribosome and M is metabolism. These are the equilibrium constants. So the, for the mass action case, these are the three gammas. So basically what's nice is that we know how much to allocate. Uh, so, so sorry, I didn't say this. The allocation is the square root of this gamma in this case. So we know how much to allocate to transporter, to, to metabolism, and to the ribosome if we want to be optimal. And it's the square root of this function. Okay, and this doesn't change. So what's not realistic in this model is that it doesn't change. You see there's no effect of the sugar concentration on any of these. Uh, and that's actually why you get this kind of monocurve, which I don't think is very realistic, which is uh, a linear increase with the sugar, right? So allocation doesn't change. You increase sugar, all the efficiencies increase linearly, and everything increases linearly, and that's what you get, okay? Um, any questions? Okay, the, the, the equilibrium line is, is uh, of course, you cannot grow when, there's, when S0 equals Sn over K equilibrium, right? There's no priming force. So that's where you hit zero. Okay. Um, yeah, so as I said, the allocation of enzyme is constant. Hmm. Again, not, not a very good solution, I think. 
the second one we tried uh, is the thermodynamic rate law. I showed you the approximate solution, which we'll just use as is because it's very good. Uh, I, ju I just changed the delta G to the explicit uh, um, description of it just to have the parameter we want, the sugar concentration. So we can see it here. Uh, so this basically, this function looks like this. A bit more realistic. But the, again, I'm, I'm, I have to say that there's two things that are wrong. First of all, it's not, it's not the, what we call a Michaelis menten curve. So it doesn't have the K50 uh, in the same way. So the curvature is not the same. It could still fit the data, we don't know. But the main problem is that there's an equilibrium uh, point here again. So you're not hitting zero when you when you're lowering the sugar, there's some kind of limiting sugar concentration that is based on the K equilibrium. And if you make it very, very far from equilibrium, you, won't, you will just get a very different shape. So you, these two things are connected. Um, and the other sad thing about this model is that the allocation changes non, not linearly, but also not in a nice way. Like it's even hard to, there's no formula for them, but they're basically, yeah, change in a very unexpected way and does, doesn't fit any data at all. Okay, and the Michaelis Menten kinetics um, is uh, required a bit more work because, uh, because we have four metabolites, but we want the first one to not be included in this like uh, constraint because it's supposed to be an external metabolite now, right? The sugar concentration is not part of this uh, uh, metabolic constraint on metabolites. So if you do that, you get uh, you get this expression, which looks very very nice because it's again uh, already you can see that it's going to work for the monocurve, uh, and you get the uh, you get the analytical expression for the maximal rate. Again, this maximal rate depends only on kinetic parameters, okay, and, uh, and this constraint as well, and the, and the, we already called it the mono uh, coefficient which is uh, the same denominator with a different uh, numerator. Um, okay. So this is how it looks. Um, what's nice, I, so I don't, I'm not comparing it to data yet, so all these numbers are just uh, completely arbitrary. Uh, but, uh, but you can already see that very easily if you have a measurement for the Monod curve, you can kind of get a, an idea of like how it relates to these um, kinetic parameters. And it, because it's an uh, analytical formula, we can also, if it works, it can predict maybe how things uh, change if you change one of these parameters, hopefully. Of course, so I should have said it before, every point on this curve assumes that the cell optimizes everything at every, every sugar concentration from scratch, right? So it don't, doesn't matter what happened uh, last night, it will always optimize everything again at this point. Okay? Otherwise, the growth rate will be lower than that. Um, okay, so, so yeah, I'm already saying about it. Okay, so, uh, <laughs> so uh, the, the last thing I, I probably want to show you is that the enzyme, so in this case, this is the solution, the enzyme allocations are also expressions based more or less on the same parameters. Uh, and it also looks very, very complicated. But what's really, really nice is that you can rewrite them as a function of mu, which is, uh, mu is, a, okay, it's already a complex function of all these other things. But when you do that, you actually see that it's a linear function. So uh, the transporter actually is an, has a negative sign, so it's the total minus a linear function of mu. Uh, and uh, the metabolites and ribosomes go up with mu, and this is what it looks like. Of course, the numbers, again, don't look at the numbers, okay? These, I just used the, all the parameters are one, I think, in this model. Okay. Um, good. Uh, and something else to, to know about this, so uh, the, the lines uh, go, yeah, the, the sugar concentration goes from zero to infinity, so a lot as you grow, grow growth rate, but the lines stop some, at some point. They don't go all the way down because there's the maximal growth rate you can reach is here, okay? So they just have to stop somewhere. 
Um, okay. Um, so, okay, so I'll just uh, summarize. So, so we tried three options. I would say one of them works and the other two don't, basically. It's very simple terms. Um, and we tried, we tried to figure out why the, the gas Fenton <laughs> case works. And I think we can generalize it a bit. So we don't have to assume everything is Mikhail Fenton. What really matters is that the transporter is Mikhail Fenton. Okay, so that this reaction, basically, is saturable and not reversible. Then you always will get something like this. So the, the allocation uh, of enzymes will, will shift between the transporter and everything else. So the transporter will go down with mu and the rest will go up with mu. But inside the cell, things will stay always proportionally the same because if you solve it once, you solve it for every, all the time because there's, again, the transporter is irreversible. So there's, no, there's nothing changing inside the cell except the, the flux, right? So everything just scales up proportionally all the time in terms of metab enzymes, not metabolites. So metabolites don't change at all, actually. So, uh, so that's actually uh, a reason to get that's why we get this curve. It makes sense a lot in retrospect. Um, and, uh, and we also tried it with a, with a general uh, enzyme cost minimization when, when we made the transporter more irreversible. It looks exactly the same, like in all the range of the model. OK. Um, OK, so I'll summarize. Uh, the, uh, I have five minutes. Ten minutes? Oh, okay. Uh, I started early, I think. <laughs> okay. So, um, so the mass action assumption gives us a mass action a growth law. Uh, the thermodynamic assumption gives us something that approximately looks like a thermodynamic growth law. And the Michaelis Menten assumption gives us a mono curve, which is also a Michaelis Menten type growth law. So, I think just forget about cell models. I think. If you have a few reactions that have the same kind of kinetics, approximate kinetics, you can lump them together to one. Uh, as long as, like, the, of course, everything is optimized, you can lump them to one. And maybe, maybe this is the kind of mechanism that could be used by cells. Or, uh, especially the, the last one is nice because, because of this linearity, right? So you can lump them into one operon and just like, scale up the operon together. And that, that, that will give you almost the optimal solution all the time. Um, okay, so that, that's basically all I have to say. So, uh, so I repeat the mantra that the <laughs> enzyme customization is a con convex problem. Uh, we have a few analytical solutions I showed you today uh, that are a bit more I don't, informative than just saying it's convex, I hope. Uh, uh, and we, in we apply, to, apply them to coarse grain models, we find that only one of the three approximation gives us more or less reasonable uh, growth laws. Uh, of course, reality is more complicated, but I think it will necessarily have to have this, at least part of it will have to look like this kind of irreversible because it cannot be linear all the way, of course. Um, but I do want to say one last note that I think that, and that's something maybe interesting to look at for you, Terry is that uh, I think the thermodynamic growth law could be relevant for some organisms that are really, like the methanogens that are very close to equilibrium. People have shown that actually can, like you can give them uh, methane and they, they made hydrogen. So they're definitely, all, everything is reversible. So maybe their growth laws look very different, right? There's no irreversible step. Uh, so it could look more like the, the other one. Yeah, and uh, uh, that's all I have. These are the list of references. And if you want to read anything, then this QR code is the link to the presentation. You can just uh, get all the references. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Okay. Perfectly on time. So we can ask some questions. So we are... Um, clarification, yeah. uh, uh, you assumed that the epsilon total is a constant, right? Yeah. 
So, um, I think no. I know what you want to say. <laughs> so it's 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 the fraction which is yeah, a constant a, one, right? But uh, the whole sorry, thing can change with. Is, I know your, in your formation everything is uh, uh, kind of copy numbers, but here we only look at concentrations. So epsilon is a concentration of of enzymes. Ah, this yeah. is concentration. Yes. Uh, also, all the parameters that you saw are concentrations. Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. <laughs> they should say that. Should say that from now on. Okay, okay. Uh, can I repeat <laughs> yeah. my question now? Uh, because yeah, I, I, I still did not it, quite get it because uh, it's sort of not the. My brain is tired after full day of talks. But uh, in particular, this S total, if I want to think of. I, I know that, of course, biology does not optimize. We learned the mantra, so <laughs> very thank you. Uh, but. Uh, if S total is something, then it's some sort of constraint on, you know, you cannot pack too much metabolites inside the cell. And easier model, you told that if you don't impose this constraint, everything blows up. And I understand why, because there, you know, there is no limit how high you can take each one. So it's tragedy of the commons. Easier model operates far away from the tragedy of the commons, because it, in biology, it probably is not super you know, osmolarity, unless it's caused by pH, is not a huge problem. So uh, how the internal concentrations S compare to S total, and how they compare to capital K's? Yeah, so I think there are two questions. One is, is, yep. is if we assume that sum of all metabolites is, is this actually S total, is it really the, a close to a, con a physical constraint? And this, I think, is hard to answer, but uh, but I think, uh, I mean, in E. coli, it's probably a bit low, but there, there are uh, organisms where, like, it's, uh, you know, many, almost a molar, I guess. So I think the total of all the metabolites. So I think it could be a constraint for sure. Uh, and, and the other question is, like, how is it compared to the saturation of the enzymes? And I think uh, Josh Rabinowitz has a very nice paper comparing KNs to actual measurements. And it's... It's actually, the, the noise, like, the variation is huge, but basically the average is more or less this, like the same place. So most, the average enzyme will have the substrate at the, around the KN, which means that, 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 that they don't want, they, they could uh, almost double the rate if they, the, the, this wasn't a constraint. And what, what emerges from your optimal model with Michaelis Menten part? What's the optimum? Ah, yeah. What is oh, the well, I, S? I can't the... answer that because I, we didn't use any real parameters yet. So we just I, I just use a one for all the parameters. So it will be just some monstrous expression which you cannot. Re I mean, uh, isn't it like? Uh, could you flash back the formula again for the Michaelis Menten? Yeah. Yeah, the, the, yeah. Something like the, yeah. I maybe yeah. This one. The, Something like this, right? If I just completely stupidly think that the capital K over lowercase k is the same for all, uh, then this, uh, the, 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 what, whatever you have in square will be just basically uh, four times capital K divided by lowercase k. And uh, basically then, then, then you will have it comparable to to 3 over k in the left-hand side, except that there will be k over s total. <laughs> so I, I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm trying to digest yeah, this no, in some no, simplest so, so I think limit. The important question is how, how much, like s dot tells you how much you need to care about the left side versus the right side, right? If it's very, very low, then you will be very far from being saturated, right? And then you really need to care about these optimizing everything close to the KM. If, if the estrogen is very, very high and you have no constraint, basically you can just saturate everything, you know, like nothing matters. And then you, see. you get, this is called like the path, we used to call the pathway specific activity. It's just like summing all the specific activities and you get like solution for, for saturation conditions. So the relevant parameter is capital K, whatever it is, if it is the same over S total. That's a dimensionless parameter. Right, capital K is has units of concentrations, and S total has units of concentrations. Uh, ah, yeah. How they? Yeah, the, the ratio of these two things. Yes. Okay. I would say, yeah. Beautiful.
beautiful talk. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, so just to answer uh, your question, so for E. coli, w with these uh, curves that uh, Eli showed, we, we can actually determine each of these, you know, the, the one over KCAT of this and that, right? And this works very well, but roughly just ignoring the last term. So empirically, we, we kind of know that, that it, it's, uh, because we have no handle on KM, right? Uh, yeah, we, we do not know what, what S total means, and, okay? What, what works is this uh, Monon matches up. Uh, data, you can estimate the one over KK mm -hmm, for, for each mm -hmm, of these. Mm -hmm. okay, and uh, uh, yeah, so, so it, it worked out very well. Just if, if you ignore the last term, which means the last term is small. And in the limit where KT is the uh, uh, smallest one, then of course we get a trivial result that Monon is just a transporter. Uh, Monod constant, yeah, the, but the, but the thing is, this this is all effective, right? So so when, when you when when you do the proteomics, you see the C sector changing, uh, or whatever. Okay, the uh, the that's an effective K cat for all of the catabolic enzyme that's expressed, of which only like a few percent is used to transport the carbon you're actually using. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so you cannot use copron the actual. Is, yeah, the entire lack of run that I was showing. Not just, uh, Not just the transporter, but the transporter is again is a lumping of all, all the things from the external metabolites to I don't know, where it joins the rest of the metabolism. So, so it's a really yeah. weird thing though because the, the optimization works beautifully, right? I mean, the, with all these numbers, except that when you look at the actual enzyme, it's right. If if it's optimizing, you want to say use all of the transporter, you want to give it to lactose if you're using lactose. It is not doing that. Yeah, why was it optimized the, the downstream framework, one? It's using the optimization framework. It's almost like E. coli knows this fr yeah. uh, framework. It's, it's stealing it. Yeah, that, it's that's not still, using it in that's, practice. I agree. That's still a very interesting Amazing. reason. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Any other question? Okay, if not, yeah. thanks a lot thanks again. Thanks for listening. We now have the tutorial on uh, FBA.